Hello, everybody who's with us here today for this uh, online workshop about monitoring staff treatment and compensation policies. This is Michael Healy here of CDS Consulting Co-op, and this is the, oh, I think, fourth now in our series of workshops on monitoring. Um, we've got several template reports online in our CBUILD library. I encourage you to check those out. And we've got more workshops coming up throughout the summer, and that schedule is also online in the library. So if you go to our CBUILD library uh, homepage, and on the left side, you'll see a link for GM report support. That'll give you all the information. I'm guessing that since you're here, you already know some of that. But I just want to make sure that you continue to refer to that space there where these reports will be posted as we present them. So again, this is Michael Healy here of CDS Consulting Co-op. Um, I also want to take a minute to introduce um, Joel Brock, who's going to be here helping with the technical side of stuff and um, also explaining how you can participate in this workshop. We really do want your comments, suggestions, questions throughout. Um, so pay close attention because uh, Joel is going to tell you how to do that. Joel? Right. Um, I just want to call your attention to the GoToWebinar toolbar where you have a little hand button. So at any time, if you want to jump into the conversation, just click that hand button, and uh, that way we'll see that you have something to contribute, and we'll, uh, we'll turn on your audio so that you can ask your question or give your feedback uh, live on the air. Uh, and if you are calling in on the phone, if you enter in the audio PIN number, then we'll be able to uh, unmute you. So thanks, and do feel free to jump in. All right. Uh, so again, welcome, and I'll, I'll uh, continue to welcome people as they show up here. Um, I want to say, that as we're getting started here, that this has been um, an amazingly rich educational experience for me to try to take um, samples of reporting that managers are using successfully and try to cull through those samples looking for what are um, techniques, tools, ideas that managers are using that work for their own situation and their own co-op, for their own board, but that really might apply more universally. Um, as, and that's been the theme throughout this, uh, this series, um, trying to get reporting styles, reporting templates that work both for a manager and for a board that are easy for managers to use, easy for managers to insert their own data into, and also easy for boards to read and understand um, what's going on operationally so they can rest assured that the manager is taking care of business and the board can focus their attention on, on that other amazingly good stuff that boards want to focus on. Um, some of you who are on the workshop today are folks who have contributed some of your ideas to this process. I want to thank you for that. Um, and I want to encourage you all, um, both those who have contributed some of your own sample policy reports and those of you who haven't, to really look at this as we go through it and ask yourself, does this make sense for me? How could I use this? Um, why is it being done that particular way? Any of those questions you have, any reactions you have, um, this workshop today will be much more interesting for all of us, um, much more educational if we're hearing your voices. Um, so don't hesitate to ask questions, to offer comments, um, to throw in your own quick idea about a way you found to report on something um, that you think might be useful for other managers to hear about. Um, what I've got here is uh, the this template report, as I said. Um, I want to remind you that it's based on the CBUILDS policy templates that we've posted more and more boards are using at least some part of those policy templates, and so we feel like this is a good um, use of managers' time to then think about how to report on those policies. But also, you might have, your board might have policies that are somewhat different, but you still might find particular um, uh, details in this sample report that you could just pick right up and copy into your own reporting. Uh, so be ready for that. Um, be ready for uh, thinking about this one in particular as a, a topic that just 
never seems to disappear as one of great importance, and for a lot of good reasons. Um, the, the idea of how our co-op owners um, think about the workplace, uh, think about employment uh, opportunities, staff treatment, um, these, are, these are really uh, high value items in our co-ops pretty much universally. There was a really good article um, about three years ago now that I want to refer you to if you haven't checked it out in a while. And it was really written from a board perspective, but it was focusing throughout on this idea also about staff treatment. Um, so Marilyn Scholl uh, headed that article, The Board's Role in the Accountability Stream. It's a nice one to go back and refer to. In this report, um, a couple things that I want to point out that uh, what I found when I looked at the samples that managers were sending me is that there are really three uh, core ideas that I wanted to try to incorporate. One was the, the variety of methodologies that managers were relying on uh, to assess staff treatment or to assess compensation. Um, the second was the content of the report itself. So how did managers then take those methodologies and translate that into objective data that could go into a report to the board to demonstrate compliance or non-compliance, as the case might be? Um, and then also just, just formatting ideas. How are managers presenting their reports in ways that make them readable, make them clear? So throughout uh, this sample as we go through, I encourage you to look at those things, both kind of what's, what's behind the report, what, what are the managers actually doing, um, and then how is the report being put together. One of the first things I want to point out here, um, this again is just kind of the introduction to the whole report. We'll get into the body in just a second. At the very top, there is um, this statement here, which I've been, um, if you look at all the sample reports that are out uh, right now, you'll see that this, this heading looks more or less the same in each one, a, a standard format. Um, this statement here, something like this, um, is a statement that then allows the manager not to report compliance piece by piece, sub-policy by sub-policy. Um, it's a way of kind of cleaning up the body of the report, having it less wordy. Um, so it's just one thing that I've liked when I've seen that. Um, it's certainly not the only way. And I wanted to mention that if you were looking for how, the, how do managers report a non-compliant situation, um, the first report that we put out, the B1 financial conditions, showed an example of how would a manager using this format um, report about a non-compliant situation. Uh, and then lastly, in the heading here, I want to mention that every heading um, includes an attachment section. Um, in this case, there are three attachments that seemed particularly useful. Um, the first is really an FYI. Um, you'll see where it shows up later. Um, so it's not the it's not the actual data for the report for this monitoring report, but it's background information from which some of that data is drawn. Uh, the same is true for the second attachment in this case, a livable wage worksheet. Um, and again, whether or not you included these attachments would depend whether or not you were using this kind of data in your report. But in this case also, the, the, this worksheet is background information. It's not actually the data that the manager is relying on. The third attachment in this case is actually a data piece, and you'll see how that shows up in the report later. So keep in mind that with all these reports, attachments, um, are uh, very useful, a way to, to give information to the board um, that doesn't necessarily then have to be thrown into the body of the report. So the report itself, itself stays very clean, very spare, um, very direct. So all that is about the introduction uh, to the topic, to the formatting of the reports, uh, to the goals here. Um, as we get started, um, I'll, I'll, every once in a while I'll just hesitate for a second just to make sure that uh, if you have a question or a comment um, that you have a chance to uh, insert it into the conversation. Um, and then if I don't hear anything now, I'll assume that you're pretty good with that and we'll keep on going. So just a quick moment, I'll check and see. Any questions or comments so far? 
I don't see any hands yet, Michael, but just a reminder to the attendees, if you do want to jump into the conversation, just click the hand button in your GoToWebinar toolbar. All right. Um, and and uh, as we get through, again, as you're looking at both the, the policies here and the, the reporting, realize that your own policies may not say exactly this same, uh, the, use these same words, um, but the, the basic uh, principles here I think really do apply, and that's really what I was looking for as I uh, sifted through um, the reports that I got from the managers contributing. One of the keys in formatting um, that you'll see in all of our uh, report templates is that managers report uh, in three ways. It's, it's a step-by-step -step report. And so the first is offering an interpretation. Um, and what I was noticing in the, in the samples that I received is that managers are getting better and better at not trying to create a dictionary definition of a policy, um, but we're really just stepping back away from the board's words and saying, OK, board, here's how I'm thinking about what you're talking about, and then explaining that. Um, this interpretation is not at all intended to be something where you as a manager um, should, should believe this needs to be your interpretation. I'm just offering up these interpretations as reasonable ones, as ones that, as I was looking at the samples, seemed to really stand out in terms of their clarity uh, or in terms of their um, ability to then lead the, the, the board and the manager through the next steps of creating clear operational definitions uh, and data points. So we start with an interpretation, which is somewhat generally stated. Then we get into very specific operational definitions, which are uh, point by point, what are the measurables that the manager is going to use to demonstrate compliance. And then thirdly, we'll get into the data, which then relates piece by piece to those operational definitions. So a couple things here. Um, this, as I started reading reports, what I realized managers were, were doing was um, trying to find a way both to address the spe specifics of the policy, but were also thinking about the workplace overall, that this, this was about um, trying to be an excellent workplace. Um, in this case, uh, there are two top-level stipulations here, um, one about fairness, one about clarity. Uh, and what we're going to do in this template report is say that those two pieces are really addressed pretty clearly in the sub-policies below. So we're not going to talk about those at the top here. We're going to talk about those later. Um, but the piece about safety um, isn't addressed somewhere else. So we are going to, in this top-level section of the policy, we are going to report about safety. Then there's a note here, and this note here is, is not quite, but close to word for word that I took from one of, um, one of the uh, managers who's using um, employee survey uh, data um, to a little bit of an FYI, a little bit of education for the board about what the sur where it came from, why it should be considered valid, um, and what it is measuring. Uh, so I'm not going to read through these details here, but um, there were uh, two of the reports that I saw, one from Glenn Bergman at Weaver's Way, one from Tim Bartlett at Lexington Co-op. Um, both were relying on survey data and really doing a nice job of using that data uh, as a way to show the board that, um, they're, that, that the staff themselves uh, have weighed in on this. One thing that's really uh, neat about the survey idea is that um, a constant uh, criticism or concern that directors have about this model of policy governance is, is they're afraid um, or worried um, that all they're ever hearing is the manager's opinion. Oh, you know, if, if we're only hearing from the manager, how do we know it's really true? And by using survey data, Managers are essentially creating a controlled way for the board to hear directly from the staff. Um, and so that there's um, some objective data, some ways for the staff to actually, in a sense, speak directly to the board about how they feel about their own workplace. Um, so it's a really nice way of addressing that ongoing concern 
where it's not the manager saying, here's what I think about the workplace, but here's what the employees think themselves. Um, in this beginning part, this talks about a survey that was done in two years in a row. Um, it doesn't seem to be necessary for surveys to be done annually. Um, I encourage anyone who's thinking about this maybe to talk to Carolee Coulter, who um, this, this survey came from, um, and think about what's, what's a valid frequency. Um, we're not going to get into that level of detail in this report. Um, I want to say that that's not my area of expertise, but you might find that it's useful to talk to Carolee or someone like that about um, how often surveys can or should be done to be valid. But just, again, thinking about surveys as a really nice way of presenting data that's not just out of the mouth of the GM. So there's the top level interpretation saying later we're going to talk about fairness and clarity. Um, we're using survey data throughout. And right now we're going to address the question of safety. So throughout this report, you'll see a couple things that we are showing in this report survey data, which is about, as I mentioned in that um, interpretation up top there, survey data is about staff perceptions. Um, but along with that survey data, the manager is also including, wherever possible, objective third-party data that corroborates. Um, so in this case, not only will the staff rate safety highly, um, but uh, the, the manager is saying we're also going to rely on a, a third party and objective measurement of safety. Now this particular example uh, came from um, Kari uh, at Hunger Mountain who was using uh, the experience rating um, based on workers' compensation insurance calculations. A really nice, simple, straightforward, objective measurement of the safety of a workplace. There were a couple other examples that managers were using, um, but this one just really s struck me as, as about as straightforward as it gets. So what we have here now is we have three definitions. Um, one, oh, I, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that the first one here was the overall sense of the workplace. And this ties to the manager's interpretation above, basically saying that the, the real goal was to have a good workplace. Um, and so because of that interpretation, the manager is saying one of the things we're going to survey people, survey staff about, is their overall sense. So you'll notice that throughout the report, if there's three bullet points under operational definitions, there's going to be three bullet points under the data section, uh, a one-to-one -one correspondence. So, and throughout this particular um, report, what you'll see is the staff survey broken up into chunks so that under each operational definition, there's just the chunk of the survey that relates to that definition. Again, making it very readable, very straightforward, letting directors look at it a piece at a time, rather than just dumping a big pile of survey data at them. Remember at the top, the, the attachment in this case did include the full survey and the full results. Um, but here, we're just pulling out the pieces that relate directly to the definitions. So what we see is the overall satisfaction. Um, there were two questions on the survey in this particular case that related to overall satisfaction. Second, staff's perception about safety. And there were five questions on this survey about safety. Um, pretty straightforward. I'm, I wasn't trying to show scores in these, um, but you can imagine the numbers would be in here. Oh, I also want to, uh, throughout this report, what you'll see is that um, there's a reminder with all these tables, just reminding the board, the directors as they're reading it, that in terms of compliance, what we're, all, what we're looking at is the score, the most recent score. This other stuff is here as FYI. So these are here to show what's happened in the past, um, but the, the point of compliance is what's going on in this most recent survey. So you'll see that note throughout. So there's a survey about overall satisfaction. There's the survey questions about safety. Uh, and then, again, in tabular form, here is the experience rating. Again, showing what the, the um, numbers were 
in the past. This information here um, was just kind of to help a board again see kind of in, in a broad brush way, you know, are we having more employees with fewer claims, more employees with less claims, but that was really FYI um, that the point of about the compliance benchmark was this, the experience rating. And I just thought that was a very nicely presented uh, format. So that's the top level uh, policy, and we're going to get into all the sub-policies. So again, I'll hesitate just a second to see if there are any um, questions, comments, suggestions, anything else someone has noticed about that first part. There was a question, Michael, from Karen Doherty. Um, and you're on the air, Karen, if you wanted to ask your question. Oh, oh I am. OK. Hi, I just, Karen. Hi, Michael. This is um, just confusing because, anyway, my question is, um, so the benchmark for the experience rating, can you yes. point me to where I could, you were in the industry, I could find that that was um, uh, relative to my co-op of my size and my state? Yeah, well, what I saw in this case, um, and again, this came from Kari Bradley, and so he might actually be able to give you a better answer than me, because this is, again, okay. not my area of expertise, but um, Kari basically said uh, this, that it's a standard industry calculation, um, and I'm assuming that that information would come from your workers' comp carrier. Um, mm -hmm. So as I read that, that's what I assumed, but truthfully, I can't. I can't tell you that for sure. Okay, I'll call. And I, okay, good. Um, and I, and and if you do get a good answer to that, let me know um, so I can pass it on. Thanks. Good, great question. Thanks, Karen. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, Karen's momentary confusion there is a good chance for us to just tell you again that if you do raise your hand, if you click on that button there uh, in your toolbar. Um, then Joel will recognize that and he'll let you know when you're on the air to ask your question. So we encourage you to do that. Um, and that's how it'll work throughout. Thanks for being our guinea pig there, Karen. Um, okay. Now we're getting into the sub-policies. And I won't spend too much time talking about the formatting uh, that we did up above. So I'm going to look mostly at the content now and, and what folks are including. In the interpretation, in this case, um, the manager gives uh, a, a quick overall uh, sense of what's going on here, what the, what the critical uh, point is, and then takes a moment to address grievance procedures in particular. And again, I think this makes a lot of sense um, as I was looking at these reports because this is perennially this this issue about staff staff treatment and grievances is one that concerns um, very thoughtful directors how do we how do we know that staff really are are having uh, fair treatment and so in this case um, there are more managers more co-ops that are relying on um, the cooperative model grievance procedure um, and this interpretation is a quick introduction from a manager to a director or to the board saying, hey, this is this model procedure we're, we're using yet. We're going to incorporate that into our, into our own personnel policies. And rather than explaining all the details of the procedure, just reminding directors that they can go learn more about it. And in fact, there's a really great field guide um, for directors uh, in the Seabuild library. Uh, this, again, Having the, the the model grievance procedure, there are a lot of really thoughtful cooperators who who um, put time and energy into putting this together, um, and I think that as more co-ops and managers incorporate this into the policy, the personnel policies, we'll see that um, it helps boards and directors realize that that really is being taken care of. In this case, there are half a dozen or so, let's see, four seven different operational definitions about. Remember, we're talking about personnel policies and the board's particular concern about making sure that they're clear, making sure that grievances are handled well, that all the employees um, understand them, have, have, are, that the policies are accessible. And then there's a very specific uh, caveat here that they, the procedures or the personnel policies, I'm sorry, should have this information about employment being neither permanent nor guaranteed. 
So check this out in terms of definitions. It's really a nice set of step-by-step -step assurances to a board that this is being well taken care of. Um, first off, that there is a manual. It's current and it's on file. Um, second, that the manual will be reviewed periodically by a third-party professional. Um, I did see in one report um, that a manager was uh, and what, I don't know how she put it, requiring that, that the co-op's HR manager had professional certification, and then that was enough to be the person able to review the manual and make sure it was up to date, as long as that person had their own certification up to date. I thought that was a really nice way of doing it, um, but the idea of having a third party um, person look at it, um, again, gives the board a sense that someone other than the manager is assuring us that this is okay. Reviewing things periodically, how often you do that. Again, I'm not trying to say in this report that your, your cycle needs to be what it says here, but think about that as a manager. How often could I do this to assure the board that we're in good shape? So there is a manual. It is reviewed by a professional. That there is a specific grievance process in it based on the model procedure. That staff will indicate that they understand and, and approve of the grievance procedure, that it works for them that staff will also indicate that they have received the policy manual, that they will acknowledge that they are at-will employees, um, and that they understand the manual. So if you look at that set of definitions, it really does cover what the board is asking for here. And then we go and we see the data that the, the manager is presenting. Again, each data point is related to each operational definition. A couple things to point out here, um, again, trying not to hand the board the personnel policy manual and say, hey, look at it. Um, but in this case, the manager is saying, it, it's available for review. So if a director said, I'd like to see it, sure, no, no reason for them not to be able to see it. And, and they can come and pick up a copy. Um, that's a, a great way to reassure folks that the, the, the data is verifiable. Um, so I'm not just telling you that there is a policy manual, but look, you could go see it if you want to. Here then, in tabular form again, just the data. Who reviewed it? When did they review it? Um, and again, offering that if someone wants to see the most recent report about the review, they're welcome to. Um, that there's, there should be you know, no reason why um, a, a director who really was very curious or, or just had too much time on their hands or whatever it might be um, could take a look at that stuff. The third data point relates to the grievance procedure. You know, here it is. It's there. It's on these pages. You don't have to spell out the procedure. That's not what the board is asking for. They're just, they want to know that it exists. Now here we're using, again, the survey data. Do the employees understand and approve of the grievance procedure? And here were three questions about grievance, grievance procedures um, and, and a way for the manager to report on staff perceptions. As always, presenting several years worth of data, assuming you have it, again, for if you're just starting this, you would only have one year of data. But presenting several years of data can help people see both that this is something that's being, being addressed over a period of time and that there might be trends in the data, maybe showing that scores are improving over time. That could indicate that the manager is really, or the HR manager is really focused on this issue. Next, here is um, a statement that the employees each have a signed acknowledgement form um, and that they're in their personnel file. In this case, the, the uh, manager is saying, you can look at these, but this is not something where I, as a manager, can allow any director to walk in and look in someone's personnel file. So this is one where the manager is reminding the board that if the whole board decides that they want to create a direct inspection, um, then they can do that, and that's fine. Um, but we're not going to just have personnel files open to individual directors. And I think that little caveat in there, the, the, that statement is very clear, very straightforward. Here was then just the language out of the personnel manual. Um, you could again just refer to it, uh, saying that this language exists on a certain page, the way that the grievance procedure was referred to. 
this one, um, I, I saw this in one manager's report. I thought, well, it's, it's pretty good. It's, it was a very specific criteria in the board's policy, and so here's a very specific response to it. Here are the words. And finally, um, from the survey, employees, did you receive the manual? Was it useful to you? Do you understand it? Here are the results. So this is all about, again, the manager demonstrating to the board that there are personnel policies in place. They're, they're reasonably good. They've been checked out by professionals, that they work for the employees, and they do include um, uh, provisions for handling of grievances fairly and thoroughly. So I, again, a lot of really good ideas here in how folks are finding to both the methodologies of taking care of these kinds of, of board prescriptions and then also on reporting about them. So any questions, any comments, I'd love to hear what you think about this, uh, this formatting or, or this methodology. Anyone have a, have a thought they want to put in right now? All right. We will keep on going because there's so much more interesting stuff here. I know that you all um, will find many things that are useful in this report. Um, again, as I went through, I just I was really impressed with what I was seeing. Uh, the second policy provision is making sure that not only are there policies, but that they are applied consistently. Um, and essentially, then, that's what the manager is saying. Here's how I'm interpreting this. It's not enough just to have the policies. Managers should make sure that managers should be trained so that they know how the policies work, and employees should believe that the policies are working. And so then here's the two, uh, two definitions, one about management training and then the survey data. Um, there were a couple different operational definitions about what management training might involve or how often. Um, again, I'm not trying to say here that this annual training um, regimen is the definition that you as a manager should use, um, but it was a good uh, example. It seemed to be pretty common, actually, in the samples that I was looking at, something along these lines. Whatever it is you're doing, whatever it is, however you're defining it, um, then presenting on this in a tabular form, again, is very straightforward. You know, how many managers were there and, and how many of them attended one training in the past 12 months? Um, and as long as the those the number of managers attending um, matches the number of managers, then you're showing compliance. A real easy number-to-number -number comparison to demonstrate compliance. And then second, we're going to follow this with the survey data. Um, and then there's a set of questions. Here they are out of the staff survey um, and the employees' responses, all about the policies and their consistency of application. If you look at this, what you'll see is there's not there's not a lot of narrative in the report. It's one of the things that the, the managers who are um, really honing their skills are finding that um, they can do less and less long, long narratives, lots of you know, paragraphs, and really presenting very clear, concise information in tabular form. Some things really lend themselves to that, and this is a case. So this was about making sure policies were consistently applied. Any questions about that, about those two sides of it? One, that managers are getting trained. Second, that staff perception is that they're being consistently applied. All right, we'll keep on cruising. Here's one now that, um, as I was looking at the samples, I was thinking, yeah, there's, there's not as much real solid um, reporting here, so I didn't have what I felt like were really uh, totally, totally key, excellent reporting styles. And so I'd really be curious if anyone who's online um, has something that they've used here that they think is more clear than this. So these I thought were adequate um, reports, r reporting styles, definitions, and data. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking that the next round of this work, uh, I'm, I'm assuming we'll get even a better way of reporting on this. So this is basically just making sure that documentation is maintained. Um, actually, there was one report that 
that I believe someone referred to the, the their auditor, um, but it wasn't clear that the auditor was actually auditing personnel documentation. Um, so I didn't include that here. Uh, but I think some folks have done that where they've had an HR specialist come in and just do a review of documentation, security, and so forth and give a report. Actually, I just saw a version of a report just yesterday, um, and so I think that might be a, a way to report on this policy. So is there anyone now online um, who has done something like that, has found a, a, a clear, objective way to, to report on this policy? And again, if you would like to chime in, um, you can raise your hand and I'll unmute your, your audio. All right. So um, like I said, this, I, this particular part of the report in my own mind was kind of, well, it's, it's the one that I feel less um, solid about. Um, but I, I do believe that that, that um, third party report that I saw yesterday might be the next step, the next level of um, really giving objective data to a board uh, and to the co-op owners that employees' records are really being well taken care of. Um, so now we're getting into the part of this policy that deals with compensation and benefits. Um, and again, it's, it's a, a topic that is often a high value topic for boards and for managers and for employees. And so you'll see throughout here there's some parts of it that are about the methodology, what's going on operationally to address these issues, but then also how is the manager reporting on that. So in this piece here, what I want to just point out in particular, and you can go back and read the details later, the um, wages, the compensation, there, there seem to be really two um, very valid ways of talking about wage comparisons. And one was comparing wages at the co-op to other regional or local wages. Um, another comparison was the livable wage comparison. Now, sometimes that is dictated by the way the board's policy is written. Um, sometimes it will be determined by the manager's interpretation. Uh, so I'm just showing in here, this is the only case where I'm actually showing two different ways of, of uh, creating definitions and, and data points just because I thought they were really two very interesting and equally valid approaches. Um, so, so if you look at the operational definitions, again, this is about compensation and benefits being equitable. Uh, and there were um, four definitions. One is that each job has a job description, and each job description is a, has an associated pay level. So just starting with that. Um, and then the comparison, either externally to similar jobs in our region or externally to livable wages. Um, and in this case, what I've seen more often than not is that um, managers are finding using that the, the CJ and co-op livable wage model um, is a very excellent tool for doing this work. Um, there are some other local um, or regional livable wage projects um, the, the co-op livable wage model just seems like it's really well designed, again, by cooperators, for cooperators, uh, and more and more managers are relying on it. So we'll see this then in the data points, uh, the two different ways of showing data. The benefits one, um, as I looked at the sample reports, um, what I saw is it's much harder to do exact comparisons. Um, and the, the, the approach that I saw that I felt like was a good starting place was offering to demonstrate reasonable comparability to other co-ops. Um, there, there didn't seem to be anyone able to show comparability um, in, a, in a reliable, solid way to uh, other area businesses. But again, I'll, I'll check and see if one of you out there has an idea about how to do that. Uh, and then finally, that um, rather than trying to go through um, bit by bit all the benefits and show that uh, everybody got exactly the same benefits, relying on the, the grievance procedure, the grievance process as the tool employees could use if they were not receiving benefits that they should receive. And so once we've already demonstrated that the grievance process really is a valid one and, and useful, usable, then if employees aren't filing grievances about benefits, then we can assume that 
their benefits are as equitable as they need to be. So I really thought that was a nice way of focusing on not the specific data about benefits, but on what happens if benefits aren't equitable. Well, there'd be grievances. Um, and again, that data then is very easy to come by. So uh, here, job descriptions, the manager's saying they're in the, in the personnel files. Everyone has their job description. Um, and again, if, someone, if the board needs to see that, they, they could ha make a board decision for direct inspection. Second, looking at comparisons to similar jobs. Um, again, depending on your job titles, depending on the jobs as they're defined for your region, I think this is all data from the Bureau of Labor's, Labor and Standards, um, comparing what our job titles are to similar jobs regionally, um, and what is the comparison. Uh, so the, the comparison you're making, what the, what the compliance requirement would be is listed above in the operational definition. So here's just the data. Um, this, I thought, uh, you know, it's very thorough. There's a lot of detail, a lot of information. Um, if, though, the livable wage comparison is one that you're trying to make, it's actually a much simpler set of data to look at. Um, you're uh, really just comparing what's the lowest wage. In this case, um, the manager said that we're not necessarily paying livable wages to new employees, but we are paying livable wages to everyone after they've been here for at least a year. And so the real comparison is, what's the lowest wage of any employee who's been here more than a year, and what's the co-op livable wage? So you're just comparing these two numbers here. Um, again, that whole worksheet attachment about co-op livable wages is the background, the calculations that help us determine this number here, but all that the board really needs to see is the comparison of these two numbers. So I, I really I like that as a, a very clear, very straightforward way of uh, talking about wages. Now benefits, again, as I said, it, it seemed like it was much harder for managers to um, talk about equitable benefit comparisons, or I'm sorry, external benefit comparisons. Um, this table here, um, I saw in one manager's report, it seemed like a really nice way of trying to put together this information in one place. The dilemma is, oh my gosh, look at this level of detail. There's so much here, and it's really out of character with the rest of the report. Um, and it doesn't really allow for a direct, like in the table we just looked at about liberal wages, you're comparing one number to another number. Here, what we're comparing is sort of this overall sense of how much discount, paid time off, health, medical insurance, holiday pay, and so forth are these various costs providing? And is there a way for us to compare what's going on in our co-op to these other co-ops? Um, again, it provided data. It was right there. Um, it's much more subjective because it's still open to anyone saying, well, that's, that's not as good as or that's better than something else. But it was a good, solid attempt by a manager to say, look, this is what I've got. This is how I can compare. Um, and then finally, the information about grievances. In this case, valid grievances or invalid. And either way, there just weren't any grievances filed during this reporting period. So um, before I scan on down to the next policy provision, I just want to check and see um, if anyone had questions, comments, ideas about um, this wage and benefits comparison. All right. Um, then we're getting down to the last policy provision here um, in this template. Uh, and this is where boards are basically saying, GM, you're not in charge of your own compensation and benefits. You're in charge of everyone else's. Um, but the board really is the ultimate authority um, for the GM's compensation. So then the GM is just reminding people that we, together, um, use the board GM compensation process. If you all aren't using that, I encourage you to look at that uh, process in the CBUILD library. Um, it's a really good tool that's being very effective for the boards and managers using it. Um, 
but whatever you're using, w remind the board, remind yourself that that is decided at some other place, not here, and that the benefits that apply to everybody, if insurance coverage changes or whatever, that applies to the manager. There are a number of different ways that managers are trying to find to report on this. The one that seemed really very solid um, was just a memo, and this is the attachment that I mentioned before at the very beginning that actually is a data piece um, where the HR manager basically signs and says, hey, board, I can affirm that uh, you know the GM's compensation benefits is based on that information that you all gave me um, at, the, at the end of the GM compensation process. Uh, so again, it's the board hearing from someone other than the manager um, affirming that what the manager is saying is true. Very simple, very straightforward, not trying to detail in the report itself, uh, but just saying the memo is the, is the data point. So what we see, that's really that's the end of this uh, template report. Again, it includes the three um, themes, which is that there's some methodology, there's some things managers are doing to assure um, staff treatment and compensation benefits are, are being taken care of. Then there are some ways that managers are defining the policy uh, and creating operational definitions and then formatting that that data. So any questions you have about any of that stuff, either the reasons why managers are doing what they're doing or uh, how they're formatting the reports. Awesome. Well, if you do have questions, I encourage you to um, either you could write me directly, you could uh, talk to um, one of the other CBUILD consultants about it. Or you could talk to one of your colleagues. There were a number of colleagues. I mentioned a few by name um, here today. Uh, if I haven't mentioned someone by name, it's only because it didn't occur to me in the moment. But I've really learned a lot from the managers who've been sharing their sample reports. Um, and so you all can learn a lot from each other. So thank you for being here. Thanks for your time and attention. Um, I encourage you to come back and join us on July 14th. We're going to have a little bit of time off here between uh, this and the next one, but on July 14th we'll be presenting two more template reports, uh, one on communication to the board and the other on support for the board. Um, and both, again, promise to be very exciting. So thank you, Joel, thank you for uh, taking care of the, the technical side of stuff here. And I think if there, I'll give a second just for, in case there's a question, but then we will sign off. All right. Bye then, everybody. We'll see you next time.